Welcome back, everyone, for another interview at Room for Discussion. Today, we'll be talking about a hot topic, namely global warming. Now, there are a lot of different models, predictions, and solutions out there, but what is really the best way to tackle one of the most defining issues of our time and create a more sustainable future for all? So our guest today, he has an answer. His think tank tries to address the critical trade-offs between climate, sustainability, and welfare that we will have to make in the 21st century. Uh, he also has a definitive list of priority areas that we should tackle first. However, some of his opinions um, are a bit more controversial than others, and he's not been able to avoid a fair amount of notoriety and criticism. So to really delve into these topics today, we would like to welcome up uh, Björn Lomborg to the stage. Let's give him a warm applause. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. You. Good welcome to be here. Stage. Thank you. It's welcome. You have your Thanks. seat. All right. So, welcome to our semi-comfortable couches. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're really happy to have you here today. And uh, I think we want to get down to the nitty-gritty immediately. So, we actually wanted to ask you... We have read some headlines that you are considered the bad boy of climate science. Uh, why do you think that is? So, I mean, first of all, it's a weird thing to be the bad boy of that, but uh, I think a lot of people are very concerned about climate change, and so they want nothing to stand in the way for everything to be done. You know, there's sort of a sense of what is the right things to do, and, and I totally get that. You know, if you're in a political sphere on talking about climate change, very clearly you want sort of the smoothest uh, uh, way forward to get people to implement a lot of the policies that you're arguing for. Now, my problem is uh, I think we're vastly over-worried, mm. and I also think we often end up picking really poor policies, and that we need to know. But I understand that, you know, when, if you're arguing for these poor policies, of course I'm annoying. Uh, but, but, but I don't think, it, it's not a good way to have a conversation to you know, call other people names. That was kind of what Donald Trump was very, very good at, right? And it didn't have a good outcome, so. Mm, definitely. Uh, you briefly summarized a little bit of the criticisms that you frequently get. Uh, but what is one piece of criticism that is actually valid, in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the, I mean, I, I, I listen to a lot of, 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 of critique, and, mm -hmm. and obviously I want to be correct in what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I try to listen to all of the different people who are making arguments. Um, uh, it'd be very strange if I was sitting up here and saying, yes, these are you know, the big areas of, of, of uh, where I've been making arguments that actually turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there are good arguments. I think there are some sensible conversations that we can have, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm sure we'll also have them here. Uh, so one of the things is uh, when people are very worried about climate change, uh, they will say, but there is a risk of a tipping point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a real risk. Uh, so the, the, the basic point is, uh, you know, most of what the UN climate panel tells us is, uh, as you emit more and more CO2, you get high and higher temperatures, but it goes in a smooth direction. You know, basically things get a little worse the more CO2 you put into the atmosphere. But what if there was sort of a, a catastrophic tipping point? where things just go catastrophically bad, mm -hmm. that would be much, much worse. And that's an argument that's actually been you know, studied fairly widely, and I think it's a relevant conversation. However, when you look at the actual parameters that we're talking about, there's two, two main points. One is that we are, uh, uh, that even if you take in all of the things that we have reasonably well studied, it simply means you should do a little more climate policy than if you don't have these uh, 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 parameters involved. The second one is uh, this sort of existential argument of saying, mm -hmm. look, my, my favorite area has a tiny bit of risk of something really catastrophic happening, so give me all your money. Mm. That's not a, I, I see how that works as an argument, but remember, there's a lot of different places around the world that could have the same sort of, we have a non-zero risk of something really bad happening. Uh, and so if you look at the uh, 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 William Nordhaus, who's the only climate economist to get the Nobel Prize in, uh, in economics, uh, he had a very long conversation with 
and I'm forgetting his name right now, but sorry, and I shouldn't, but uh, 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 Martin Weis Weissman, uh, who was arguing that there's a real risk that something very, very bad could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the points that Nordhaus made, and I think that's a very convincing argument, is to say, you can't just throw out and say, oh, but there's a non-zero risk that things could go really bad, so we should spend all the money on climate. Because there's a non-zero risk that a lot of things could go bad, so we should spend the money on all of those areas. And of course, it's logically impossible to spend all your money on many different things. Mm. You can't spend them over and over and over again. And so Nordhaus' point was, we actually don't do that. And just, to, I know this is a longer answer than what you were asking for, uh, but if, uh, so, uh, if you look back in the 1990s, uh, NASA did a uh, proposal to the US Congress where they said, we can discover 90% of all near-Earth objects that could hit Earth and basically uh, uh, wipe out humanity. We know this has happened before, so this is a real risk. Uh, and you know, so it, the uh, asteroids that are larger than uh, one kilometer in diameter. Uh, and, and then they also proposed, we can also find 99% of them for you, but of course at a higher cost. Mm -hmm. And Congress said, you know what, we'll take the 90%, but we're not going to take the 99%. And Nordhaus' point, and this is sort of a standard economist point of view, was, oh, U.S. Congress just put a price tag on what's worth of saving humanity, hmm. right? We decided we were going to say, yeah, I'm, we're going to spend 90%, you know, to get to 90% security, but we're not going to pay for the last 9% because we have other concerns. We have North Korea, and we have Ukraine, and many other, I mean, they didn't have Ukraine back then, but, well, we did have Ukraine, but not in that way, right? But the, but the fundamental point here is, we have to make trade-offs and realize that it's not just a good argument to say, oh, but everything bad could happen. Yeah, sure, but that's true everywhere. Hmm. So, um, you often boil it down to a sort of numbers game, uh, and you also cite a lot of uh, different studies and everything in, in all the work you do, uh, yet one of the frequent uh, pieces of criticism that uh, pop up is that you misrepresent some of these studies. So, for example, Dr. Wei Peng, who did a study on uh, the estimations of costs of climate change policies for the average Americans, she felt that you were misrepresenting her study. So, um, how do you then deal with these criticisms? Um, I mean, I, I take it very seriously. I think mostly uh, it, it shows, and, and with, uh, with this particular research, it was very clear that this was an uncomfortable truth. They didn't want this out. Uh, so they'd estimated how much will it cost for America uh, to go uh, uh, several steps of, of net, uh, uh, up towards net zero. Uh, so they estimated up to 80% cost. Yep. And then in the supplementary information, which is peer reviewed and part of the article, they uh, estimated what would it cost to go up to 95%. And I just had the temerity to actually tell that to everyone else. So the cost for uh, the average American to go 80% uh, is about $5,000 per person per year in 2050. Uh, and the cost to go to 95% in their model was $11,000. Now, what they said was, but we haven't validated that well enough, and it was just in supplementary uh, uh, information. I'm, mm. I'm like, sure, but, but, you know, it's part of your article, and surely this is the kind of conversation that you actually want. It's not like Biden is promising to go 80%. He's promising to go 100%. So in some sense, we should have the 100% number. They didn't, but they did provide a 95%. I get that this is politically inconvenient. It's very, very clear that they were very, I'm sure they got a lot of flack from their research, from their researcher friends who said, you should never put that in there mm -hmm. because then you know, evil people like Bjorn Lomborg is going to utilize, utilize this. But the end of the day is you have a number that's incredibly politically relevant. I don't think you can sort of say, oh, but you can't use that in a bad sort of way. You can't say that it's very costly. So you think then that um, her saying that this was a misrepresentation was politically motivated? I think that's certainly strongly what comes out of this, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Even though the researchers who did the own study say that the uh, dollar estimates were unreliable based on the different um, scopes or ambitions of the kind of climate programs they were looking in those models? 
Well, what they said was that it's harder to get the model to be calibrated when you get very close to zero. Mm. Uh, and that's absolutely true. Uh, and I would, I would love for us to, I, th I think, you know, let's take a step back. I think there's a fundamental problem that we have a situation where almost all rich country governments have made promises that are fantastically costly. Mm -hmm. Yet we have done almost no costing. So you know, uh, really the only global costings are from McKinsey and Bank of America, not you know well reput uh, reputable uh, uh, academic organizations. And to a very large extent, it's because nobody wants to put those numbers on the table because then it becomes clear that we're not actually willing to pay for those. Just to give you an example, uh, the the uh, the total cost uh, is going to be about a third of the global tax intake. You're just not going to get people to do that. It's going to, for India, it's, the cost is going to be about 9%, according to McKinsey uh, Institute, 9% of GDP. Mm. That's three quarters of their, global, of their national tax intake from all levels of government in India. This, it's just not going to happen. And I get why people don't want to put this number out there, but you do need it. Now, so here is an organization, here's a group of researchers who actually did put out an estimate of what will it cost to 95%. I, I get that they would rather not have been the ones that were on the hook for saying this is actually going to be incredibly costly, but I don't think it's unreasonable. I actually think it's incredibly useful for someone like me to come out and say, look, this is going to be very, very costly. Is this really what we want to do? And, and it goes back to the conversation, of course, of realizing if we're trying to do something that will cost enormous amounts of money over the next 30 years, it's not sustainable if that means you're going to get more and more cost, and then eventually people are going to you know, turn against this. They're going to elect people like Donald Trump and others uh, and say, no, we don't want to pay for this. If it's not sustainable, then you really have to start asking, should we do this in an other way or in a smarter way? Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at kind of the news landscape regarding climate change, um, the Guardian recently published an article by the Intergovernmental Panel for um, Climate Change, or IPCC, it was about a month ago. And the headline goes, um, scientists deliver final warning on climate crisis. Act now or it's too late. Do you think this headline is accurate? <laughs> so the, the problem is, and if, if you don't mind, we, we talked about this out in the, in the green room, uh, because I, I don't know, uh, I guess most of you guys haven't read my book. I, I'm kind of disappointed, but so if, if you just allow me just to give a very, very brief sort of uh, introduction to what it is I'm actually saying so we don't just jump into the deep water sure. uh, here. Um, so fundamentally, global warming is a real problem, and it is something we should fix. It's not the end of the world. It is a problem along with many other problems in the world. And so my argument is to say we need to find a way that is both sustainable, that is something that people are actually willing to uh, pay for, and that can be implemented in the long run. And this is much harder than it sounds. So back to your question. So, uh, 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 Garden. Stop the lies! 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 In this very moment, people around the globe are suffering. Do we just people are fleeing, people are dying. We can just wait. There is almost nothing to eat anymore in the Horn of Africa and in Madagascar. Southeast Asia is facing record temperatures. In Thailand, the temperature went above 45 degrees. People are dying at these temperatures. Canada experienced temperature 25 degrees above normal. 25 degrees above normal temperature. This started massive wildfires releasing, releasing huge amounts of quantities of uh, carbon dioxide into the air. Spain and Italy are suffering under heat waves and droughts um, that are becoming more and more an issue for the food production. Bureau Lombard. Uh, the guest today, coming in today, is a famous denier of, climate, of the climate crisis, and it makes him also a science denier. He, uh, as more, maybe the most prominent denier in the world, is responsible for the death of millions of people. Policy to mitigate the effects we are seeing right now has stopped or um, was stopped or weakened by his efforts. Um, this makes him partly responsible for the death of millions. How do you sleep at night, Mr. Lombard? when you know your lies are killing millions. And he has not recognized his lies, he has continued using new strategies to spread doubt, focusing on cost, and yet again, he is lying. Climate policy is relatively cheap when done smartly, and the costs that are saved by mitigation are enormous. It is an absolute disgrace that this man is
is invited to speak here. He's not a scientist, he is a murderer. Stop the lie! Stop the lie! Stop the lie! Guys? Stop the lie! Stop the lie! Guys, if you could please take a seat again. Thank you very much. Um, so, guys, if you could please take a seat again. Guys, if you can please, please take a seat. We will be addressing several of the topics you brought up, so if you can please take a seat. So, uh, there was a, a list of accusations there, and we actually want to start by addressing uh, one important one. You are often called a climate denialist, um, although you have explicitly stated several times that climate change is real and it's a problem. So when this sort of situation pops up? I don't know if it's common for you. How no, does I can't it, say. No. How does it feel? Well, I mean, it's a little disappointing that this person uh, who feel very strongly about it is actually not listening to what I'm trying to say, uh, but he's possibly just decided he already knows. Look, um, I very clearly said just a little while ago that global warming is a real problem. But no, that's, not, an, that's got not good enough. You can't say anything but the ex absolute extreme, otherwise you're a science denier. Now, let's just take one example that he said, that there are heat waves and more people die from heat. That's absolutely true. There are more heat waves, and that will be partly because of climate change, so you will also see more people dying from heat. Now, we will actually know how to avoid many of these, and we should do that. But that's absolutely true. But you can't just say that without also recognizing that as temperatures rise, you will also see fewer cold waves. Now, that's important because cold waves almost everywhere in the world kill very many more people than uh, heat waves. So the latest Lancet study estimates that about 500,000 people die each year from heat, but about 4.5 million people die each year from cold. That's nine times as many. So it actually turns out that over the last couple of decades, what we've seen is that as temperatures have risen, we've seen more people die from heat, but many more people not dying from cold. Hmm. So the estimate is it's about 116,000 more people dying from heat and about 283,000 fewer people dying from cold. Overall, there's actually fewer people dying because of the temperature increases that we've seen over the last 20 years. Is that relevant? Am I a murderer for pointing out that? No, I'm actually very, very clearly pointing out we should spend our money smartly and not just stupidly deciding to say, here is one particular way of doing policy that is fairly ineffective, that will help fairly little, where we could do much, much more good with the same amount of money. I'm not going to argue that, that this person, I'm, I'm not sure what his name is, that he is a murderer. I think he's very well-intentioned, but he's very clearly not interested in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that really does tell us something that we're not being well-informed and, and, and set up in a conversation that will actually help us make the best decisions for the future. Mm -hmm. But if we take a look at kind of the contrast between the two narratives here, so to summarize your point of view a little bit is that climate change is real, it is a real problem with real negative effects. However, there are other things we should also concentrate on versus um, in the common discourse we often hear that the Earth um, might become uninhabitable yeah. in 10 years' time or uh, within our lifetime. So basically, we have this huge gap between these two narratives. Uh, like, how did that happen? So I think if, if you look at humanity's set up for a very, very long time, we've always had these, you know, these stories about how the world is very rapidly coming to an end. Here's a huge catastrophe. We need to do something about this. Uh, if you know the, uh, the uh, American journalist from the turn of last century, uh, Menekin, uh, he, he's, he, has, he has a lot of aphorisms that are very good, but one of them is uh, the, the goal of practical policy is to keep the populace alarmed mm -hmm. and hence clamoring to be led to safety often by scare stories that are partly made up. 
uh, he uses the word hobgoblins. Uh, but the, the fundamental point here is to say that you know, the sort of standard way that you've always portrayed stuff is, oh my God, you guys are going to be invaded by Germany. You've got to give me more power to make sure that we can build up the army so we can avoid being taken over by Germany. Now, there's probably some truth to it. There certainly has been a couple of times that Germany has come in here, right? Uh, and 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 there's the, you know there's this is true for almost all of these kinds of stories. There's a real risk that the world, you know, uh, uh, if you look back on acid rain, for instance, uh, the world would run out of forest. Uh, mm -hmm. The the uh, 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 um, uh, sorry, the limits to growth. The idea that we're going to run out of all kinds of stuff. It's not that they are untrue, but it's that they are being sort of taken to the extreme uh, end point, and that rarely ma makes for good policy. Now, it makes for great policy for the individual policymakers, which mm -hmm. is why they jump on board for this, because it gives them a lot of power, it gives them a lot of opportunity, and of course it also give, uh, delivers a lot of funds, but it doesn't make for good policy. So again, my point here is to say we need to rein in our tendency to just go to whatever extreme and start talking about what are smart decisions. So if you then, uh, you have these two extremes, but if you have an institute like the IPCC, for example, I would uh, definitely consider that a uh, middle of the road reliable. Yes. Uh, so they say that with 3% of temperature rise, it poses a uh, substantial... Three degrees, you mean? Yeah, three yeah. degrees. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. Um, Celsius also, by the way. It poses substantial risks to marine yeah. ecosystems. Yes. With two degrees um, temperature rise, you, have a, you risk the die-off of 99% of coral reefs. Um, so I would also say that it's not populist discourse, that this is uh, not only a problem, but it's actually quite an important problem. It's even almost an emergency. So look, the UN Climate Panel, you asked that question before, uh, uh, it's the last time to get to you know, uh, the point of 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees. Uh, that's absolutely the last, time, uh, last point of view. Uh, I, I would argue that most people who are in the, in, in the know would say we probably passed that. Mm. But there's absolutely an argument of saying that more or higher temperatures mean more risks. Hmm. Absolutely. This is not the conversation, though. The problem here is to say that's only one part of the argument. This is what I really try to bring to the table. And look, this is not me who come up with that. That's, again, you know, all of climate economics. This is William Nordhaus, uh, the only climate economist to win the Nobel Prize in, climate, uh, in economics. Their main point, and I think this is really what we need to recognize, is there are real costs to climate. But there are also real costs to climate policy. Given that we have to pay both, we have to find a way to have a discussion about how do we minimize the sum of those two costs. We only talk about the costs of climate, not the cost of climate policy, but those are substantial, just again to point out, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about five or six trillion dollars per year. That's, you know, five or six percent of global GDP. Mm -hmm. This is an out. It, that, this is a totally outsized conversation compared to pretty much anything else we, we, we talk about. This is more expensive than any other thing that humanity has done. And, and so again, one part of it is we're not actually doing it. Mm. The other part is that if we're serious about this, maybe we should have a discussion about how do we do this effectively. Mm -hmm. And before we take a look at your concrete solutions that you're offering for that, uh, let us have a time for some audience questions. Um, if anybody has a question, they can raise their hand and we will bring a microphone to them. There will also be, yeah? Okay, so in the green shirt yep. here we have. Oh, hi. Um, so I come from a country which is both vulnerable to climate change, um, Thailand, obviously it's, it's very, very vulnerable to climate change. And, but it's also a country that needs a lot of um, economic growth because a lot of development needs to be made, a lot of infrastructure needs to be built. So sometimes in this discourse, there seems to be a dilemma between development and like sustainability, um, especially for developing countries. So my question is, like, is this a false dilemma? Can we both grow and be sustainable, or, or do we have to make that trade-off? So green growth is a Thank possible. you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point. And I, I think it's not a false dilemma. 
Uh, it, it, is, it, it exactly goes to the point of saying there are real costs to climate and there are real costs to climate policy. One of the things that the rich world seems to be doing is to tell a lot of the poor part of the world or the poorer part of the world that I'm sorry, yes, we got rich on fossil fuels, but you know, we can't allow you to do the same because the world is ending. Uh, now, see what happened, for instance, with Germany when, uh, when, the, uh, when we had the Ukraine uh, war. It was not that Germany said, oh, we can't get gas from uh, Russia anymore. All right, we'll freeze a little for the environment. No, <laughs> we just buy it on the, uh, on the market. We actually bought it away from you know, Pakistan and many other nations. And basically saying, no, we're not actually going to live without all the conveniences. And I think it fundamentally underscores uh, 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 an, an important point that I think is, is lacking in much of the conversation and also lacking in the very simple sort of, you know, when people stand up here and say murder and stuff. Uh, the, the fundamental point here is that most people are willing to do some good for the environment, but they're not willing to give up most of their lifestyle. And especially the poor part of the world is not willing to say, all right, so we'll just stay in poverty. They want development, and we know that development comes from a very large part from lots of cheap and available energy. Now, the simple way to fix this problem, and that goes to, you know, how do we overcome this dilemma, is of course to have a, a, an energy source that is both incredibly green and incredibly cheap. Then we'd be done. But we don't have that source right now, and that's why one of my points, uh, and you know, we, we assembled more than 50 of the world's top climate economists and three Nobel laureates to try to figure out how do we smartly do this. Their best long-term uh, solution was to say dramatically increase investment in green energy R&D. Fundamentally, if we have a solution, if we have a cheap green energy source, Everyone will buy it. Uh, just to give you one example, you know, look at, uh, at uh, fourth generation nuclear. This, this is not going to solve everything, right? But fourth generation nuclear promises to be incredibly cheap and incredibly green. Now, of course, third generation also said the same thing. So, you know, let's wait and see if that actually happens. But the point here is to say, if we could come up with incredibly cheap and incredibly safe and very, and very green uh, fourth generation nuclear power, everyone would buy it. It wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to have, you know, a Paris agreement uh, to get every phone, uh, to sort of force them to do it. They'd just do it because it was cheap and effective. So, um, also, we will have more time for audience questions later, but uh, just in the interest of time, we have to move on. Um, so, you hint at it already, but uh, let's imagine for a moment the UN General Secretary uh, calls you up and puts you in charge of spending $50 billion to solve climate change. What would be your top priority areas and why? I, I, I've just got to sorry, say, the UN doesn't have that kind of power, but I would I would be very flattered. We were thinking uh, of a, yes. a top figure in the yes, world. Yes, but, but, but you know, I, I think it's more likely that we could actually get the G7 or the G20 or something like that to actually do it. But you know, if you had $50 billion or thereabouts, you should spend almost all of it on research and development into green energy. So the, the amazing thing is, you, all, almost everyone here has probably heard about the Paris Agreement that we did in 2015, where we decided we we're gonna keep uh, temperatures below uh, two degrees, maybe even one and a half degrees. And we're not living up to most of our promises. Not surprisingly, because it's incredibly expensive, and most politicians like to make grand promises, but they don't actually want their populations to spend that money. There was an, there was an other deal at the very same Paris Agreement, it's the lesser known Paris Agreement uh, with Obama and a lot of the world leaders, also the EU leaders, uh, and a lot of uh, billionaires that made the uh, uh, mission uh, innovation, it was called, where they promised they were gonna double spending in green energy research, uh, energy research and development. And we didn't do that either, but nobody's heard about it. And the difference is that the climate policies cost trillions of dollars. This would literally cost in the sort of, you know, 50 to 100 billion. I would probably start by saying I'd like another 50 billion, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's in the, in the games of the rule, uh, the rules of the game. But, you know, fundamentally, we could, Instead of talking about spending billions of trillions of dollars, we could spend billions or hundreds of billions of dollars on research and development. It would have a much greater chance of fixing this problem. Now, the reason why we don't is because it feels very good to put up a solar, wind, uh, solar park or a wind park or something. It feels like you've done something. If you're just funding eggheads to do research, it doesn't feel like you've done anything. But remember, almost all things that we've solved in the world 
have not been solved by telling people, I'm sorry, would you mind being a little poor and a little colder and a little more comfortable, but at least we'll you know, try to fix climate change? That never works. It works in a short time, but it doesn't really work. Hmm. The way you do this is by getting technology that fixes it. And, and sorry, I'm just going to tell one very quick story. If you've heard about and it's not entirely true, but it's a great story. Um, back in the 1850s, most of Europe and Northeast America was lit up with whale oil. If you were rich, you'd use whale oil, just simply because it burnt much brighter, it burnt much cleaner, it was just simply a much better energy source. It had that unfortunate side effect that it meant uh, that we were basically uh, hunting the whales to extinction. Now, the standard environmental approach to this would be to tell everyone, sorry, would you mind to go back to that much more sooty and old and less bright uh, oil that you used before uh, to keep your, uh, your homes lit? And of course, people would not do that in order to try to save the whales. What did save the whales was that we had innovation. Somebody found, it turned out that it was, you know, we found oil in Pennsylvania in 1852. And it turns out it's much easier to pick up oil in Pennsylvania than go out in the middle of the ocean to kill a whale. And so we ended up, all of us, using oil products. Now, again, we need to switch away from that. But the point here is you solve problems by coming up with a technological solution that means you get cheaper stuff that's better for, you know, for whales in this instance, and we need the, uh, you know, the fourth generation nuclear and a lot of other technologies mm -hmm. for green energy. And um, I think it's fair to say also in your book that betting on technology um, is quite an emphasis on your proposed solutions. However, that also contains a lot of risks. Yes. So for example, let's say you want to invest five billion a year in nuclear fusion, right? This might only become a uh, commercially available in five, 15, or maybe even in 100 years time. Yeah. So, yeah, how do you justify betting so big on techn te technological process when you can't really um, compensate the risk? So, so I, think, I think it's a real argument to say that people say, look, Bjorn, you're saying we should just spend a lot of money on research and hope for the best, yeah. hope that we'll figure out a solution in the next 20 or 40 years. First of all, We've been led down this alley that we, or that we think that we're going to fix this in 10 or 20 years globally. We're not. We're not at all on that pathway. Uh, if you look at the International Energy Agency, if you look at their pathway on current promises, it seems to indicate that we will get to net zero by the end of next century. Mm. So we're not anywhere close to this. But let's just say... It would be really nice if we could do this fast, but we're not going to do this. We are going to do this if we're really fortunate in this century. So the first part is to get our expectations right. But then the second part is, I'm, I'm arguing that we should, and not just me, this is some of the world's top economists and three Nobel laureates who are basically saying, this is how you actually fix the problem, by spending a lot more money on research and development. Let's say that this has a 80% you know, chance of success. You're absolutely right, that's at risk to take. Mm. But I think if we look at the current policy, that has a pretty much a 0% chance of succeeding. So I'm simply saying, let's do something that's much smarter, much cheaper, much more effective, and actually has a much greater chance of succeeding. But it's not foolproof. It would be absurd if I was sitting up here, but it would also be absurd if anyone else was sitting up here and saying, I have the way that we're actually going to fix this. Currently, we're just making grand promises, but not actually delivering. So, um, this argument that you're laying up, it sounds almost like you're doing a, a choice between mitigation or investing in technologies. And let me just do a hypothetical here. So, um, a smoker comes up to you and says that there's an 80% chance in the next 15 years you'll have a, a cancer cure because we're spending so much money on it every year. So, I'm actually not going to stop smoking because it'll be solved in the future. Um, do you really think that we can justify inaction in the present by this uh, hope for a better future? So I'm, <laughs> I, I hate arguing on, on, uh, uh, on, on these sorts of metaphors because we probably get misled by the metaphor. The real question here is to say, do we want to do what we've tried to do for the last 30 years, which is incredibly expensive and delivers very little of the pathway to actually fixing climate change? Or do we want to fix it by spending much smarter, much less, something that we could actually see happening and that has a much greater chance of, success, of, of succeeding? But the, 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 the reason why your metaphor doesn't work is because it's so, somehow suggesting, well, you could just stop smoking. 
And, and that, that, that seems true, but I don't know, you're, I'm not a smoker. I, you know, I think non-smokers has this tendency of thinking, oh, smokers are just, you know, come on, how hard is it? Well, clearly, empirically, it turns out that it's pretty hard. And it's a little bit the same thing that, as we're saying, oh, come on, how hard is it for Germany to just not do with it, you know, without, the, uh, without the gas? Uh, you're from Germany, but I'm pretty sure if they, if if Schultz had decided, all right, we're just not going to have that. You, know, you guys are just going to be uh, cold. It would have been a revolution in Germany. I mean, people are just not going to be able to buy this. They're not going to be willing to accept that. And so, in that sense, we're much, much more addicted to fossil fuels. Not because they're fossil fuels, not because they're bad, but because that's what made us rich. And it goes to the same point that you you asked about before. This is what is the lifeblood of most of what makes us rich. That's why it's so hard to tell people, oh, just go to cold turkey. What we're essentially doing in rich world is cutting a little bit, feeling incredibly good about ourselves, spending a lot of money, but actually not delivering something that most other countries would like to say, oh, we want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But now let's take a look at the things that we actually do in the present yeah. um, to combat climate change. Now, in previous interviews, you criticized solar and wind technologies a lot, but aren't those so-called green technologies exactly the kind of technologies you say we should bet on? So we should bet on stuff that is cheaper than fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. But currently, solar and wind is cheaper when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. But the problem is we need uh, energy 24-7. Mm -hmm. And so what we're currently doing is more... Uh, I mean, there, look, look there, there are some places where solar is a, a very good idea. For instance, in California, in the middle of the day, because when the sun is shining, you get a lot of power. And that's also exactly when you need the, uh, uh, the air conditioning. So you need the extra uh, uh, bit of power. That actually makes a, a lot of sense. Mm. But that's unfortunately not the place, most places, and certainly not for 100% or anywhere near 100%. So there's some argument for, for having solar and wind. I'm very happy that they're cheaper, but this is not what's going to translate most of our uh, emissions. There's two parts of this. One is to recognize that we're not going to get all of our uh, energy systems down to up to 100% renewables anytime soon when we're talking about electricity. The other part is to recognize that electricity is a very small part. It's about a fifth of our total carbon emissions. So most of this is industrial processes, it's heating, and it's uh, all these things that are really hard to do, like steel, uh, cement, and fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And these are just much, much harder problems. So we've tried for the really easy ones, and it turns out to be fairly expensive, to do a little bit. Now, I'm not against doing a little bit, but I'd much rather do smart stuff and do it a lot. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, shift tax a little bit. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, the difference uh, between cold waves and heat waves, and you talk about uh, there are ways of adapting to these temperature fluctuations. And this is something that we found throughout your work. You take on a very anthropomorphic, it's very human-centered perspective. Uh, but one of the biggest concerns about climate change right now is the effects that it will have on the natural world. So should we really deprioritize climate change mitigation at the risk of severely harming biodiversity, for example? So biodiversity is a huge issue, um, but everyone, including the World Wildlife Fund and everybody else, will argue that climate change is not the main driver of this. This is uh, agricultural usage, it's uh, invasive species, it's uh, encroachment from cities, it's the fact that we use a lot more for farming land. Those are the main issues for biodiversity. And all of these solutions are mostly about getting people out of poverty. That is, if you're ineffective and if you have lots of human stressors, you, you basically you know, cut down forest. If you're rich, and we see this very clearly in rich countries, for instance, we're reforesting because we can afford to. So this is not predominantly a question of climate policy. It's a question about all the other policies. And this goes, this goes into this general point that I try to make of saying, look, the goal of climate policy is presumably not to cut CO2. The goal of climate policy is presumably to make sure that people live better lives. Now, one way of doing that is by cutting carbon emissions because it leads to less uh, uh, temperature rises, which leads to better lives. But one of the important ways that you make people better off, 
is by making sure that they're not poor, for instance. And so a very large part of this is the solution of making sure, and that goes again to your, your question uh, uh, before, is to make sure that the poor part of the world actually get an opportunity to get out but, of poverty. So here again, you go to uh, poverty, and uh, I want But wanna... that would also help for biodiversity. Sorry, I, I yeah, thought no, that Yeah, no, no, just... Yeah. Yes. But uh, again, if you talk about reforestation, for example, you know that for biodiversity, primary forest is very different from reforested forest, so to speak. You also see IPCC, for example, they say that uh, um, with the global mean temperature increase of four degrees, you see substantial species extinction. And they say this with very high confidence. Um, so again, it seems like if there is an existential threat, and if you say that you can circumvent that for humans by adaptation, it still exists for um, the natural world. Well, my point here is, again, to say, if you care about biodiversity, why would you not go for the 80% of de determinants rather than the, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's different estimates. Uh, climate change maybe make up five or 10% of the impact on biodiversity. Why would we not go for the 80% first? I get the idea of saying that in a perfect world, we should do all of these things, but this is not such a perfect world because remember, right now, as we're sitting and speaking, about 800 million people are starving, about 600 million people are poor, about two and a half billion people cook and keep warm with dirty fuels like dun, carbon, and, 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 and uh, wood. We are talking about making something that would, in an ideal world, would be fantastic to do, but in the real world, because we're only talking about climate, we end up forgetting all these other issues as well. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, also one of, the, one of my concerns right now for, for the conversation, because one of the points that I try to make here is, uh, is that this is not just a question about climate change. Climate change is one problem that we need to fix in this world over the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But surely we seem to be almost ignorant or ignoring all the other challenges. Uh, right now, there is about 400 and 70 million people, so almost a half a billion kids in primary school in the developing world. 80% of these kids are in school but will learn almost nothing. This makes for a much, much wor worse world in almost any instance. We have very simple and very effective technologies to help deal with that, and I'd love to get into that, mm. but I also recognize we're very yeah. short in time. But the fundamental point here is, why are we not talking about that? Why are we sitting here in this world and in this room and just talking about climate change as if it was the only issue in the world and saying, well, we're going to be spending you know, trillions and arguably tens of trillions of dollars every year on this problem while every other aspect of the world also needs remediation and mm -hmm. something that we could do much, we're, much uh, cheaper. We're going to uh, go into those topics. Um, Thank you. Yeah, because we also find them very sure. important. But first, we actually wanted to give the audience one more chance Brilliant. to do some audience questions. And we have, I know that uh, the gentleman in the back there had his arm up before. Oh, can I also ask, just uh, okay. please keep them brief, if you can. Yeah, sure. Sorry. This is um, so firstly, about the hot and the cold waves. I mean, there's something very different to directly heating up the planet and killing people with hot heat waves rather than not giving people who are in cold places sufficient warming, right? There's an important moral distinction which you seem to gloss over. But to get back to the cost discussion earlier, I, I, I wonder about this. You mentioned how expensive it is to deal with climate change, but I want to push back. How expensive is it not to deal with climate change? People like Nicholas Stern, who is also like Nordhaus, an important economist in the climate sphere, says it's much more expensive not to deal with climate change than to deal with it. And the more we do now, the cheaper it is for us to do it later. What's your response to yes. that? Yes. So uh, two good questions. First of all, uh, the, uh, the heating and cooling is actually very, very, uh, uh, it's, it's a correct comp uh, comparison because what I'm talking about is the impact of increasing temperatures. There's a separate point of saying that most people who can't keep their homes uh, heated during the winter in most northern areas are actually the people who are mostly impacted by climate policies because climate policies make heating and many other energy forms 
more costly. So there's a very direct uh, impact. One, there's an important study that showed, for instance, the fact of fracking in the US, so the fact that gas became much cheaper as a natural experiment, and it actually saved about 11,000 people from dying from cold-related deaths each year in the US. So there are you know, some substantial points. But to your, you know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm correct in saying that was your central question. There are people out there who are arguing that there is, uh, uh, that it's better to do much more uh, 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 mitigation right now because it'll actually make lower cost in the future. Uh, Nicholas Stern has made a very, very bad, and I would argue, uh, and, and many uh, climate economists would argue, uh, almost non-existent uh, 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 cost-benefit analysis. However, if you lo look at the real cost-benefit analysis, which William Nordhaus did, and which is the kind of thing that actually, you know, he got the Nobel Prize for it, uh, but many others in the sem similar kind of vein have made those arguments, then it shows that you should do some, but you should not do a lot. And that's why you should not expect that a carbon tax, I'm arguing for a carbon tax also, I think a carbon tax is a good idea, but you shouldn't expect any realistic, but also any uh, optimal carbon tax will cut the temperature by a significant amount. It'll cut it by some uh, towards the end of the century, but it'll not do a, a whole lot, which is why I'm arguing that the main part uh, and that's what has been missing in this conversation is exactly what Obama and everybody else uh, uh, agreed to in Paris. Namely, we should dramatically increase our spending on green energy R&D. Mm. Mm. We can do one more brief audience question, please. Yeah, we have here in the purple. Hi, Bjorn. Thank you for being here today. Um, it seems your solution pretty heavily rests on your methodology, and we just talked about the cost-benefit analysis. Why should we trust that your methodology is the best way to go forward? That's a good question. I don't think you could make that argument in, <laughs> in, in, uh, in the 30 seconds I, I feel like I have for it. Uh, we work with uh, more than 300 of the world's top economists to look at all of these things. We, we work with seven Nobel laureates in economics to try and find what are the smartest things, not just on climate, but on a lot of different areas. Uh, we've tried to systematize uh, the, uh, the methodology. Uh, I think we have a reasonably good argument uh, for saying what, what we're saying. We've certainly published it widely, uh, also in the period literature. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you, you have to ask that question of everybody else. And if you look at most other arguments, so you know the kind of things that you, that you would hear uh, both from Nicholas Stern, but also from a lot of politicians, it's much more of a hand-waving argument of saying, this is the end of the world, we got to do something, let's do this. And, and that has some validity. That's why we're having the argument of saying, look, it's not the end of the world, it's a problem. That's what most of these uh, economic studies show, that the impact of, of climate change will be in the order of uh, 4% of GDP by the end of the century. For poor countries, uh, mostly for warmer, hotter countries, it'll be more, so maybe up, you know, for India, it would be probably 10% of their GDP. So there's a real cost. And then the, uh, the cost of trying to do something, and of course you wouldn't uh, uh, reduce the, the total impact, you'd reduce the worst part of the impact, that would also be in the order of five to 10%. This is mainly why you find, certainly on a global level, spending five to 10% now on avoiding parts of 4% by the end of the century is just not a good deal. I'm, I'm making a very sort of you know, play mobile kind of uh, argument of the, of the, uh, uh, the cost-benefit analysis. But the, the numbers simply don't add up unless you either make them very scary, that is, the global warming is the end of the world kind of thing, or that you have a discount rate that basically says the future is just as important as, uh, as the present, which is one of the things that Nicholas Stern does. Uh, but that's just not how people uh, act, and it's not how most people actually perceive the world. Mm -hmm. All right, we will move on. And you already brief, uh, briefly touched a little bit upon that a lot of your work focuses actually not only on climate change, but a lot on other issues as well. So could you maybe share with us what other issues aren't getting enough attention in your opinion? Yes, so, so, what, <laughs> so it's important, this is not about attention. It turns out that that's what, 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 what's the outcome. But basically what, what I do, my day job is not really on climate change. It's one of those things that I talk about. I talk a lot about climate change in the rich world because that's the only thing rich people really care about, sorry. I, I, I think I've, I've offended a lot of people here, but, 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 the, but the fundamental point is 
to many other people on the planet, the ones that are not in the you know, top one and a half billion people, uh, they care enormously about the fact that they don't have a good education, they don't have good health care, they don't have jobs. They have, Sorry. Oh, come Sorry. on. We had time for all there is There is 4.5 million people that are dying from cold this year, and you don't, don't give a shit, do you? You are, just, you are the kind of person... You Sorry. are the kind of person that makes... I, I believe that you're well-intentioned, sir, but I think that you're unwilling to argue and to think about the fact that you sit here in a very well... And, and, I oh, think, come on. I think perhaps the best thing is to actually talk about the other issues. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, fundamentally, there's a lot of people who suffer from all kinds of other things. You know, so basically hunger, poverty. Poverty is, you know, arguably the biggest problem in the world. Uh, uh, lack of uh, clean drinking water, sanitation, uh, uh, jobs, uh, uh, nutrition, those kinds of things. And what we try to do is to look at where can you spend an extra dollar or an extra euro or an extra shilling or whatever your currency is and do the most good for these things. Hmm. And it turns out, so we've done a big project, I've just put out a new book, uh, and we're trying to get the G20 involved in this, uh, to try and think about where could you do the very most good for humanity for the next couple of decades. It turns out that there's 12 amazing things, and we define amazing by saying that for every euro spent, it delivers 15 euros of good. Hmm. And what we've found is that this is in education, as I just mentioned before. It's in, uh, in, in healthcare, so uh, tuberculosis uh, and malaria. Uh, we have uh, immunization of, of, of uh, children. Uh, uh, communicable diseases, that's a huge problem. Remember, everybody used to die from infectious diseases. Nobody dies from, well, apart from COVID, uh, dies from infectious diseases in the rich world anymore. Uh, now we die from cancer and heart disease. But that is also happening in the developing world, and there's a lot of ways we could do that. For one of the obvious ways is by getting more heart medication. Uh, if, if you, you guys are probably way too young to know this, uh, but almost ev everyone in the, uh, you know, when you get 50 and above, a lot of people get heart medication that's very, very cheap, that lowers your blood pressure and basically have saved in the order of five to 10 million people uh, each year. We could do the same thing in the developing world. And there's a lot of these kinds of things. So uh, again, uh, 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 um, e-procurement is a way to cut uh, corruption, uh, to making sure that you have better land tenure so that people will actually grow their land mm. and that they will be able to know that they own it so that they will invest more in it. There are all these kinds of things. What we estimate is, just to give you the, the sort of bottom line is, this would cost $35 billion a year. Mm. $35 billion really literally is couch change I'm just looking, but you know, it, it's a very, very little money compared to pretty much anything else we spend our money on in the world. It would save 4.2 million lives each and every year. 4.2 million lives, that's about 14% you know, of global death in the poor half of the world, and it would make the world, the poor part of the world, $1.1 trillion so richer you, uh, per year. With this, you paint a very hopeful picture, and uh, you're also saying it costs, uh, it actually has a really cheap price tag. Yes. Only 35 billion. Um, Only 35 billion. Yeah, if but you, if any to one of you have it, you know, please come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, I want to ask uh, if it's, it seems like such an incredible number, um, and if that's really the case, why is no politician doing it already? Oh, because it's boring. Yeah, no, look, how many of you have heard about tuberculosis? I mean, apart, yeah, you know, well, I mean, okay, <laughs> heard about it, but, you know, it's not something we think about, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's what Satine died of in, in Moulin Rouge. It's something that happened a long time ago. 1.4 million people die from tuberculosis every year in the world. Mm. This is, it, it killed more people than COVID did last year. But, but again, we don't like care a, about a it because then it's, who... it's, 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 it's it's boring, it's mostly weak and marginalized people, it's people who don't have a strong voice. It's not the rich people in poor countries. But truly that for that money, from. they can score easy political points, right? If it's so cheap. You'd imagine so. So the, the world spends about $6 billion in tuberculosis every year. Most of it is actually spent by developing country governments like India. India has about a third of all uh, deaths in, in tuberculosis. But Every year, the world has promised to spend about twice as much. 
So all global leaders come together and you know, promise away and say, yes, we should spend twice as much, and we just keep on not doing it. The same thing with malaria, the same thing with uh, you know, uh, these easily curable uh, 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 chronic diseases, especially heart disease. It's not rocket science, but somebody needs to point it out. And I think we have become a civilization that's very much focused on a few things that play really well on TV or Twitter or wherever you are. Uh, and, and I get that. But, you know, so we, we tend to think of ourselves as, as defenders of the boring problems. Mm. Uh, the things that doesn't say, you know, e-procurement, it's incredibly cheap. So basically, most corruption in, in, in the world happens when you procure stuff, especially from, from, uh, uh, from governments, uh, because they're the, the biggest spenders of, 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 of big stuff. And getting procurement, so a lot of rich countries, Holland has, uh, has already got e-procurement, but about 70 uh, 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 poor countries don't have e-procurement yet, and they could make a huge amount of money from this. Now, this would be in the government's interest, but of course it would not be in the guys just below you know, all the officials, because they get all, a lot of money from corruption. So you know, there's a lot of institutional uh, 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 disinterest in this sort of uh, solution. But again, we try to bring a light to saying you could, for very little money, make much, much more available opportunities for your populations. Mm. And if we take a closer look at that price tag, those 35 billion, yeah. um, according to a study by the German government, it would take, for example, to, world, uh, to end world hunger, it would take 330 billion versus um, the world food program estimate a yearly um, expenditure of 40 billion. So that number seems quite short. So yes. how do you come so, about uh, Oh, because we're not fixing nutrition. Nutrition is incredibly costly to fix. Mm -hmm. And it goes to show us, you know, look, all good things. We'd love to fix both uh, you know, uh, 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 poverty and bad education and nutrition. It turns out that the first two are fairly cheap to fix. The last one is not. It, it will partly be fixed by people coming out of poverty, and so they can actually afford more food for their, for their kids. But fundamentally, some things are really hard to do. But it's also because most, and I don't know that particular study, uh, but we, we document a lot of these studies that show that if you want to fix problems, if you ask international organizations to come up with this, they will try to fix it in the same way that we've tried to fix everything else before. Mm -hmm. and then you end up with huge cost. Just uh, let me give you uh, the example for, for education. Uh, so you know, the World Bank has made you know, a, a, a humongous meta study on all the things that work and don't work. And most things you think work, don't work. So there's a great, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia back in 2005, I believe, decided that they were going to double spending on, on education. That's very, very worthwhile. They actually put it in their, uh, their constitution. They have to spend 20% of government expenditure on education. That means Indonesia has one of the lowest class ratios in the world. They have very small classes. They have hired an, uh, another million teachers, and they are really, really well paid, these teachers. Uh, and because of the way it was instituted, you could actually do a semi-randomized controlled trial uh, on this because it happened in different provinces at different times. Uh, and so there's a very famous study, you should go and look it up, it's called Double for Nothing, uh, that basically showed that Indonesia doubled the spending and there was no impact on learning. Now, there, there was an impact on teachers. Teachers were much happier, which you know, is also a good thing, but it was presumably not the main thing that we wanted out of, of education. And the simple point here is to say, there's a lot of ways to spend an enormous amount of money and get very little out of it. There's a few really smart ways to do it incredibly well. And it, uh, it, it requires us to be both willing to say, we're not gonna fix all problems, we're gonna fix the smart ones first. And it also means that we're gonna say, we'll fix stuff that's perhaps not quite as sexy as the best thing that we would have liked to fix. Mm. So we talked a lot about uh, different major problems during this whole interview. Um, you spend a lot of your work, also your latest book, for example, trying to draw attention or try to come up with solutions to these neglected or boring problems, as you would say. So um, in the you know, sphere of solutions out there currently, is there one circulating that you feel is, uh, makes you particularly hopeful for the future? So I'm, I'm going to pick two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, that I, I don't think I was laughing. Two is better one, than one. one, one <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, on, on climate, uh, I'm just going to share this one solution. Uh, I, I, 
I don't know what's going to power the world by the end of the century. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, but Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome back in 2000, he has this amazing idea. He has this idea of saying, let's take algae, genetically modified algae, grow them out on the ocean surface, and have them soak up sunlight and CO2 and produce oil. Then we just harvest, we'll, we'll have our own Saudi Arabias out on the, on the ocean surface. Then we just harvest them. They're CO2 neutral because they've just soaked up the CO2 out there. And then we you know, basically power our entire energy uh, uh, infrastructure as it already is, but without the CO2. How cool would that be? Now, there's a lot of reasons why this might not work. It's certainly not cost effective right now, but it could be. And you know, this is one of the guys that we should be giving some research money. That's incredibly cheap. We're talking about, you know, say a million or two million dollars or something. And maybe that idea could be the one that would take over the world. That would be fantastic. Again, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical about all of these kinds of promises that we're going to you know, magically fix this. But one of those kinds of ideas is the one that will power the rest of the 21st century. So that's on, on, on energy and, uh, on, and, and climate. Uh, on on uh, education, I think the really unknown point is, if, if you look, and, uh, and I have a graph in, uh, uh, in, in my book, uh, they've done study of, uh, of, uh, of some New Delhi classes, mm -hmm. uh, but this is true pretty much everywhere. The structuring way that we teach kids is by putting all the 12-year-olds in the same grade and all the 13-year-olds in the same grade and so on. But these guys are vastly different. So what they actually show is in, in the sixth grade in, in, in New Delhi, some of these kids are actually at sixth grade. Some of them are at fifth and fourth and five. Some of them are even at first grade. They have no clue what's going on there. And what we are basically doing is we're asking a teacher go, to go into that class and try to teach all of these kids that are vastly different levels. Some of them are incredibly bored, some of them have no clue. The way to fix this, and this is very, very well documented, is to teach at the right level. So if you, for instance, and this is one of the solutions, give each kid a tablet one hour a day. It's not their tablet. This is gonna be used for a lot of other kids, right? But give them one tablet one hour a day where they, in their own language, meet a, a, an educational software that will very quickly find out what exact level are they at, and then start teaching them at their level. Right? So all these sixth graders will then go in. Some of them are actually at sixth grade and will start learning at sixth grade. Some of them are at fourth grade, but they will start learning at that level. What happens is, these kids learn so much more in that one hour than you go back and you do all the other boring stuff that doesn't work very well, uh, partly because that's the only thing we've studied, partly because that's the only way you'll get the teachers on board uh, for doing this. But if you do that one year, these kids will have learned what they normally learn three years in school. Mm. For about $30, you can make them three times smarter. And, and the net benefit in the long run, because they'll become much more productive and hence much better able to deal with everything else, uh, is we estimate about 50, uh, sorry, 65 euros back on every euro spent. That's a fantastic idea. This is well documented. This is one of the things we should do. Well, I think that that's a great note to leave it. So I want to say thank you again for coming today and thank you, thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, you, oh. You can find our upcoming interviews on our social medias. Uh, also, please subscribe to our newsletter and our next upcoming interviews. Exactly. Make sure to join them as well. Tomorrow, we have Patricia Sellers, an international criminal lawyer working on sexual violence. We also have um, Tom Middendorp, a former chief of the Dutch Defence Armies on the 17th. As well as today, we host a debate between all major parties in the student council elections. So if you're still trying to make up your mind, please join at 3 p.m. Now we can have that applause, please. Thank you.